Hello everyone, welcome to our comprehensive guide on gastroesophageal reflux disease, commonly known as the GERD. This video aims to provide a thorough understanding of this condition. So, without any further ado, let us jump right into our topic. Let us start with the very basic thing. What is GERD? The name itself says it all. Gastro esophageal reflux disease that means this is a disease where the gastric contents are refluxed into the esophagus gastro esophageal reflux disease this is a chronic condition where the stomach acid flows back into the esophagus and leads to irritation and inflammation of the esophagus this happens for a number of reasons the number one cause is the weak lower esophageal sphincter. I'll make a separate video about the lower esophageal sphincter, but for now, this is a muscular valve at the lower end of the esophagus designed to prevent the stomach acid from flowing back into the esophagus. After swallowing, when the food passes into the stomach, this sphincter closes tightly so that the contents of the stomach cannot go back upwards into the esophagus and thus this sphincter ensures that the contents remain within the stomach but when the sphincter is weakened it fails to close properly and um, the acidic contents of the stomach are easily reflexed into the esophagus and ultimately it leads to gastroesophageal reflux disease so this is the number one cause then we also have the hiatal hernia which causes the GERD Hiatal hernia is an abnormal protrusion of the stomach and other abdominal contents through the hiatus of the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity. So, the gastroesophageal junction and the lower esophageal sphincter are also displaced and they go up into the thoracic cavity. This displacement reduces the pressure of the sphincter and for this, the stomach contents can easily be refluxed into the esophagus and ultimately lead to GERD. I do have a detailed video on this topic. I mean the hiatal hernia and how it causes the GERD and also the treatment strategy in those cases. You can check out that video where I have described everything about hiatal hernia in details. I'll put the link of that video in the description box below. The next cause is increased acid production. We all know that stomach produces acid to break down the food that we swallow for easier digestion. Now what if the acid itself starts to get produced more and more? If there is more amount of acid in the stomach then certainly it has more chances to flow back into the esophagus and which will ultimately may lead to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, how this acid is produced and what causes the more production? For that, we have to look at a normal parietal cell and also the lining epithelium of the stomach. This is the lining epithelium of the stomach that we have zoomed in and showed here. And this figure is taken from the Jan Curie's Basic Histology 15th edition. Here, we can see the covering epithelium above and also the glandular epithelium in the glands below. In the glandular epithelium, we have the mucosnex cells, parietal cells, chief cells, and some enteroendocrine cells. This one specifically is known as the G cell. There are some other enterochromaffin cells as well. We are concerned about the parietal cell, the G cell, and the enterochromaffin cell in this case. Here, we have enlarged one parietal cell from the lining epithelium. This is the apical side of the parietal cell, and this is the basal side. On the apical side, there is a proton pump for pumping the proton or the hydrogen ion. And there is also a blood vessel near the basal side of the cell we can see. Now inside the parietal cell, water breaks down into the hydrogen and hydroxyl ion. This hydroxyl ion then combines with the carbon dioxide that is already present inside the parietal cell from before and together they form the bicarbonate ion inside the cell. This bicarbonate ion then is pumped out from the basal side of the cell into the blood vessel. And here we can also see a chloride ion from the blood vessel is transported into the cell 
through the basal site and then is transported into the lumen of the gastric gland through the apical site of the parietal cell. So now we have the chloride ion inside the lumen of the gastric gland. During this time, hydrogen ion or the proton is also pumped from the apical side of the cell through the hydrogen potassium pump which is also known as the proton pump into the lumen. So now we have both the hydrogen ion and the chloride ion inside the lumen of the gastric gland. Then the hydrogen ion and the chloride ion combine together to form the hydrochloric acid. This is how the hydrochloric acid is produced normally within the parietal cell. The parietal cells have histamine 2 receptor which is also known as the H2 receptor at the basal site of the cell, H4 histamine. This receptor specifically binds with histamine. Now the G cells secret gastrin. This gastrin acts on interchromaffin cells and uh, which in turn secrets histamine. This histamine then binds with the H2 receptor located at the basal side of the parietal cell. And when the histamine binds with this receptor, it stimulates the parietal cell to produce more acid. The hyperproduction of the acid may lead to acid reflux. More acid, more chances of reflux. Simple. Now, certain medications, for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or the new sites, cause more acid production. This is why we always prescribe some uh, gastric coverage like um, proton pump inhibitor, for example, um, omeprazole, isomeprazole or pantoprazole to block the proton pump or also the H2 receptor blockers like uh, cimetidine, ranitidine to block these receptors to inhibit or decrease the acid production. Now some dietary factors. Certain foods and beverages like uh, the fatty foods, caffeine, alcohol and spicy foods can trigger the production of more acids. Uh, some drugs are also responsible for this hyperproduction of acid as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, smoking is also responsible for more production of the acid and um, ultimately leads to gastroesophageal reflux disease. Some lifestyle factors also play a role in this case. Uh, the other causes of the GERD include the pregnancy or being overweight because it puts pressure on the stomach and the stomach contents can be refluxed back into the esophagus for this pressure. So these are the most common causes of the GERD. Now let us see the complications that may arise. Number one is esophagitis. Chronic exposure of the esophageal mucosa to the stomach acid can lead to irritation and inflammation known as esophagitis that means inflammation of the esophagus. The acid may also cause the erosion of the esophagus, leading to esophageal ulcer. This can cause discomfort, pain and difficulty in swallowing. Then esophageal strictures may also develop. Chronic inflammation and repeated healing of the ulcers cause scar tissue formation, leading to narrowing of the esophagus known as the esophageal stricture. There will be difficulty in swallowing in this case. Then we have the Barrett's esophagus. In some cases, long-standing exposure of the acid um, can lead to changes in the lining cells of the lower esophagus, a condition called Barrett's esophagus. Let me explain a little. The lining epithelium of the lower esophagus is non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. But in chronic exposure of the acid, these cells change themselves into columnar epithelium. Let us see how it happens. The stomach is lined by the simple columnar epithelium and they also have mucus secreting cells. These cells secrete mucus which then forms a protective layer that protects the mucosa from the acid. But when the acid is refluxed into the esophagus, the thin cells easily get burnt or injured. And also they do not have any protective mucus layer like the stomach. When there is chronic exposure of the acid in this region, the stomach cells tell them, hey, why don't you become columnar like us? And why don't you have mucus secreting cells and that can protect you? <coughs> and ultimately, the cells of this region change themselves into columnar cells and also they get the mucus secreting cells for the mucin production um, to protect this area from the acid burn. This is an adoptive uh, phenomena. 
This condition is then known as the Barrett's esophagus. But the change in the epithelium increases the risk of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma, a type of cancer in this region. Then we have the respiratory complications. Sometimes the acid is reflexed through the esophagus and can enter into the larynx, I mean in your respiratory system. It then may cause laryngitis that may lead to hoarseness of the voice. Then it can inflame the bronchioles and lungs and can lead to asthma, chest congestion, chronic cough and aspirational pneumonia. GERD can also affect your teeth. Chronic exposure to the acid can erode tooth enamel and may cause tooth decay. These are the most common complications. Now what are the symptoms? Common symptoms of GERD are heartburn, a burning sensation in the chest often after eating or usually at night. Then regurgitation. I mean there will be a sudden sour or acidic taste in the mouth often accompanied by the regurgitation of small amounts of fluid typically the saliva or water this is known as the acid brush or the water brush then chest pain discomfort or pain in the chest usually retrosternal i mean behind your sternum and often it is mistaken for cardiac pain people also present with the difficulty in swallowing known as the dysphagia a sensation of the food stuck in the throat People may experience odynophagy as well. That means pain during the swallowing. It happens especially if there is ulceration or inflammation of the esophagus. Then chronic cough, persistent coughing, often worsening at night. You know why it happens though. I have explained already in this video earlier. And there might be weight loss as well in severe cases when the patient cannot swallow properly due to stricture or inflammation. Now, how do you diagnose these cases? Diagnosis of GERD usually involves a combination of a patient history, symptom assessment, and diagnostic tests such as um, upper GI endoscopy, pH monitoring of that region, and esophageal manometry to check the pressure of the lower esophageal sphincter. You also have to do an ECG to exclude the cardiac pain. Now, there are several treatment options for GERD. Number one is lifestyle modification. Then, elevate the head of the bed while lying down. It helps the gravity to pull the contents downwards. But do not elevate too much though. Also, do not go to bed immediately after taking the meal. You have to wait for about 3-4 to four hours. You also have to avoid triggering foods. You have to quit smoking or alcohol and maintain a healthy weight. Medications like over-the-counter antacids, proton pump inhibitors, H2 receptor blockers are usually prescribed. And lastly, the surgical intervention. In severe cases where the lifestyle changes and uh, medications fail to provide relief, surgical procedures like fund application may be recommended to strengthen the lower esophageal sphincter. Now, what is fund application? Fund duplication is a surgery where we wrap the fundus of the stomach around the lower esophagus to strengthen the lower esophagus and tightening it to prevent the stomach acid from refluxing into the esophagus. This surgery is known as the Nissen fund application. So that is all about the gastroesophageal reflux disease. I hope this video helped you. Please consider subscribing to our channel and do not forget to give this video a thumbs up if you found this video useful. Thank you for watching and I will see you in my next video. Till then, take care and stay healthy.